if it takes a, to borrow a phrase from the world, if it takes a village to reach a, to reach a child, it takes the church to reach the lost. I'll just make sure that sinks in. If the world says it takes a village to reach a child or teach a child or educate a child, bring the whole village in to teach that child, it takes the church to reach the lost. It takes every single one of us to make a difference in someone else's life. And sometimes you might be doing things that you just feel like it makes no difference in the kingdom of God. I have been in places in the church through the years where people thought the only way you can make a difference for God is to get out there on the front lines and preach and scream for hours and go out there and do all these things because we got to reach the lost and how we forget sometimes that it really requires, it requires the sound guy. It requires Marco in the back. Marco, wave. There you go. It requires Marco who's being trained by Drew to be able to run all this technology when Drew goes to Florida, it's on Marco. <laughs> you know, we need Marco. When, when, uh, when the, the church needs to be cleaned, somebody's got to step in and people have got to come in and help clean the church. And yet nobody really notices that the church is clean. But we need a clean yeah. place. Somebody noticed. We need a clean place to worship in. We need, we need the house warm in the winter. We need oil. We need the house cool in the yes. summer. We need it. And I hear Betty saying amen. Amen. It amen. takes all of us. It takes all of us. We do this together. Amen. Hallelujah. It's like, boy, I want you to be more food at the, at the store to buy. And we need people like Brian to deliver it. Come on. In Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, we're dealing with relationships. I, I would, I, I built this argument and I got to defend it. I, I believe America is in a really tough place. Even the American church is in a tough place. I have been saying for months, I feel like the American church has circled the wagons, hiding behind them, hiding behind their four walls, zinging arrows at people they don't like and don't agree with, and just say, go get them, God. And we have just forgotten what our role as a church is. Uh, the church's role is not to circle the wagons. You know, wh why did the cowboys back in the Western days when they went out and they advanced out to the West, why did they circle the wagons? Because an enemy was coming after them. And why was the Native Americans their enemy? After all, we were expanding into the West. So we were claiming their land and we were going to build our, our towns and cities. And they didn't like it. So they defended themselves. Well, we saw it as they're trying to kill us. And so they, we circled, our people circled the wagons. The Native Americans tried to attack them to keep them from taking over their, their Navajo lands or the uh, Apache lands or whatever have you. And there's a whole lot more in there that, that you don't even know that goes on. And someday have a, have a conversation with Mike Bosco. He would give you some history that you never thought existed. Um, there's a lot more to it. But, but that's the, the gist of it. They, they perceived the Native Americans as an enemy, so they circled their wagons. Who do we perceive as the enemy? And we circle the wagons. Who do we see out in our world and say, they're the enemy, they're evil, they're of Satan, they're of the devil, they're, they're not our kind, they're not like us. We, we don't want them in our church, we circle the wagons. We don't want them coming in our house, so we circle the wagons. We don't, we don't want them anywhere near us, so we circle the wagons. Every nation has enemies. Israel had enemies. Israel's most pronounced or pro pronounced or profound enemy, most known enemy of their day was Rome. Why was Rome their enemy? Because they came in and took them over. Rome, Italy, no, sorry, before Italy, Rome came in and took over Jerusalem, put a puppet governor in there with Herod, 
And they, they were expanding their outposts. And, and the Israel saw outsiders as their enemy. Jesus tells a parable in, the, in who is my neighbor. And I find it interesting, you know, and I, I, I taught this on Wednesday night. I'm taking it further today. And one of the things that I stressed on Wednesday night was when Jesus tells a parable, every word he uses is on purpose. Every word. Every description is absolutely on purpose. There's no mistake. There's no accident. And oh, by the way, and out of my control, this guy was doing. When Jesus tells a story, he puts it all together absolutely on purpose because he's making a point. So when Jesus decides to, to, to answer this know-it-all's question about, well then, who's my neighbor? Jesus says, well, let me tell you. And the enemy he chooses is not Rome. He chooses another enemy. So let's look at this story. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. So this is not a question answer thing where he really wants to know. He's testing and probably getting testy. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? This expert answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. That's good. Direct question, direct answer, direct response. But the guy couldn't leave it alone. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who, Jesus, is my neighbor? Jesus, as if he could say, I was hoping you asked that. Let's have a conversation. Here comes the parable. It's the first parable he gives in a list of parables that he teaches. And he says, in reply, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, make sure you understand that description. They robbed him. They beat him. And they left him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. I stop again. Just want you to understand, because I went here on Wednesday night, and I'm not going here in great detail today. He's going down to Jericho, not up to Jericho. Jericho is more than 1,000 feet lower by sea level than Jerusalem. So if the priest is coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, he's not going to do his priestly duties. He has finished his priestly duties because he conducts his priestly duties in Jerusalem. He's going down to Jericho. It's specific here. Just in case you want to get into one of those arguments later on after I'm done preaching and you go home and say, Pastor didn't get this right because the priest can't be defiled. because So he doesn't touch the, the guy because he's going to be defiled. How can he be defiled? He's done with his job. He's going home. And why couldn't he help his fellow man? He is a priest. Just saying. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. He did a lot, didn't he? The next day he took out two denarii, or two silver coins, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. That's quite a story, all told on purpose. And Renee, we can stop to sing a really old time song right now. He poured in the oil and the wine, right? The kind that restored my soul. He found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road, so he poured out the oil and the wine. 
It's a great old song, by the way. I thought about singing it today, but I thought there'd only be two of us that would know it. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Who is the neighbor? Who is the, the good neighbor here? The good Samaritan. Samaritan's purse, where we're sending all the shoeboxes to. That's where we get that name from. The one who had mercy on him. Which of you, of these three, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replies, the one who had mercy on him. So Jesus says to the expert of the law to do what? Go and do likewise. You understand what the law is? You understand what the rule is? You understand who the neighbor is? So go do it. So who were the Samaritans real quick? They were people that came out of when, when some of the Hebrews were taken to a northern kingdom and kept enslaved by another country. And in the process, the Jews that were taken into captivity married in with that group who took them. And out of that, you get a group of people that are part Jewish and part the group that took them. And so they became known as the Samaritans. They were not liked because by the, the other Jews saw them as half-breeds. You're half-Jewish. So therefore, you're not whole Jewish. So you're half. So we don't accept you. So they were not accepted. And they resented it. Also, they felt like they were their job, if you follow the woman at the well... Our father told us that we worship at the Gershon, the other one. You guys say we got to go. We go to, it's another argument about two people groups arguing about where they worship, what they do. So they were very divisive. Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. While the Hebrews accepted all the writings of the kings, the prophets, and the Pentateuch. And uh, the Samaritans said, no, no, no. We don't, we don't acknowledge your kings. We don't acknowledge anything your people did. We only acknowledge Moses. So you see the division is deep. The anger is deep. The resentment is deep. And of all the people Jesus could choose to put in his story, he puts the Samaritan. I told you, every word is on purpose. Every word is on purpose. Lord, let this word ring loud and clear to us. Help us, Lord, to understand and apply this word to our heart and our lives. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. So the expert in the law wants to know who is my neighbor? Jesus tells this parable And describes for this man who the neighbor is. And so here are the characters in this. Somebody needs to be muted back there. So first there you have the priest. Then you have the Levite. And then you have the Samaritan. The priest walks by. And though, though his role is to minister. He doesn't even stop to check on the victim. He passes by on the other side of the road. The priest needed to heed God's word in this story. Because the priest's role is to minister to the people. To represent God to the people. And to minister to the people. But he comes by and he looks. He looks and doesn't even stop. He crosses over and says, I'm not going near this thing. He needs to heed God's word and what God's word teaches as to what you're to do as a priest. A priest in your home, a priest in your village, a priest in, your, in, in the house of God. You, you do not fulfill the role because you do not even touch those in need of your own. Something's wrong. This is not new for, for Israel. There are times when they, they absolutely do not go out and minister to their own people. There's a time when the priests don't want to serve their people. There's a time when they give up and they go out and they serve themselves. People say, we don't want to support you. They say, we don't want to serve you. Hey, hey, we agree on something. So out to the fields they go. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6 says, For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, an acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. The priest may see his roles in, in the sacrificial system, 
But where was his mercy? He understands his role in fulfilling his duties in Jerusalem. But when he's done in Jerusalem, he says, I'm done work. I'm off the clock. So sad, too bad. I ain't your dad. Micah chapter 6, verse 8 says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So whether priest or believer, what are we to desire? What does the word teach us that we should want? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. In Micah, he had showed you, O oh man, what is good. What is good in the eyes of God? What is good in the eyes of God? What does the Lord require of you? Number one, act justly. Number two, love mercy. Number three, walk humbly. I wonder, can the church get 100% on that today? Can the church get 100% of that? Not everybody in the church even fulfills this today. Right? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. We've got a lot in our church that aren't walking humbly. They're walking and they're marching in their own protests in their own minds. They skipped all the verses that say, lay your life down. They skipped all the verses that say, you know, put, put God first. If they strike you with the right cheek, give them the left cheek. We were there last week, weren't we? We are desire mercy and love mercy on behalf of others. God made a way that is, that is right in his eyes. Men do a way that is right in their own eyes. The second passerby or neighbor. You know, so the priest is a neighbor. Jesus tells a parable about the neighbors. These are your neighbors. The priest is your neighbor. The Levite is your neighbor. The Samaritan is your neighbor. Come on. So the second neighbor passes by and he's a Levite. He's, he's got a problem because he places safety and distance over compassion. He stopped, but then proceeded without helping. He, he was one of the rubberneckers. You know, when there's an accident on the side of the road, and you stop and say, oh, what's going on here? Hey, you're holding up the line, buddy. I know, but I want to see you. They're dead. Who hit who? Rubberneckers. You stop and look at an accident, and then the traffic backs up. You stop, you look, and you get out of town. The Levite stopped, looked, and he got out of town. He looked but did not stop. He was willing to look and see what was going on, but not willing to help. What good is that? If you're a Levite, and so you work in the temple, and you're supposed to have a heart for God, what good is it to look at a problem and say, oh my, there's a problem. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister was without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? The bottom line is talk is cheap. How many of you have heard promises that, no, that made to you nobody ever kept them? Yeah? How many of us made promises we didn't keep? Oh. Yeah, I, I, think, we've, I think we've been partial to both. We've been victims of one and guilty of the other. Talk is cheap. To stop, look, and leave is not enough. To stop, look, and leave is powerless. 
both the priest and the Levite in this parable are described as being more concerned about themselves than the injured man. Jesus tells this parable on purpose. He uses these individuals and their professions on purpose. He speaks to them on purpose because while they, while they can go on about Rome being their enemy and Jesus should have the Messiah is supposed to come and kick Rome out so we can have our country back. They're missing that they have people within their own backyard that they should be reaching out to and extending a hand to and loving. And they don't even want to love them. They're not willing to acknowledge them, but they want God to step in and step these others out so they can have their country back. And, and Jesus teaches them a really valuable lesson. He want all of those people out while you hate the very people in your backyard. You want a whole nation taken out of your country and send them back with a tail between their legs. But you've got a whole people group in your own backyard who you need to love and you need to forgive. You need to reach out to and care about them. You're so busy trying to take care of all this that you don't even recognize the problem that exists right here. Any of you understand where that's going? We're getting so high and mighty about all the things we, we think we're so concerned about. And yet we've got, we've got people right in our backyard, people right next door to us, people sitting right in the same church as us to have problems and needs. And, and we just ignore them and say, oh, somebody will take care of it. I'm not. Talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. The priest and the Levite in this parable are described as being more concerned about themselves than the injured man. I know I repeated that. I just hope you get it. So how are we responding to those in need? When someone presents the need to us, what's our first response? Yeah, I'll pray for you. Go away. I'll be praying for you. I'm leaving now, but I'll pray for you. Well, maybe that's all we can do. Maybe that's the only thing we have left to do because there are things we can't do. But are there times when we say that phrase because we don't want to, don't have time to, or are afraid to? And do we at this point know the difference? So do we question? Second, do we feel helpless? Some people's problems and challenges are complex. Do we feel justified walking by? The Levite felt justified. The priest felt justified in Jesus' story because somehow we walk by because that person deserves whatever they're experiencing. They reap what they sowed. Yeah, now who's, now who's laughing? Yeah, now who's got it? You know, sometimes there are things we can do. I, I tell you, we, we wake up and we get ourselves so full of emotion when we see this happening in our world with someone else. I don't know how many of you remember I think this was over in Bristol, over in the kind of like down, downtown by the Children's Museum. And there's a, I think it's Park Street or somewhere over there. And there was an older man four or five years ago that crossed the street and somebody hit him. And, and the cars were going by and, and the, the camera on somebody's building caught it. That was on the news for like three or four days, showing that old man being hit by multiple cars. And just being hit until he ended up on the side of the road. And it's like, you know, Channel 3 ran that. Channel 30 ran it. It's like, oh, it just rips you. It rips your heart. See, nobody stopped for this old man. You know, it's like three or four corners coming together there. And nobody stopped for this, this old man. Nobody stopped to make sure he was all right. They just went around him. And once in a while, we hit his feet, go over his feet because of where he was on the side of the road. And we look at that on the news and we shake our head and say, oh, God, how could anybody do that? How could anybody do that? How many of you remember the riots in California with a guy who got dragged out of his truck? You remember that in the early 90s? Anybody remember that? I got short term memory and I remember that. Some things just stick with you. He was just the wrong guy in the wrong time in the wrong place. He had nothing to do with the riots. He was just an opportunity for angry people in a mob to yank him out of his truck and then beat him mercilessly, mercilessly, senselessly on the side of the road. 
while the cameras are rolling. Sometimes I wonder um, what are they teaching in education in college when the reporters watch that and do nothing. I sometimes think, you know, they ought to have another class for reporters. I know that there's only so much they can do. Sometimes I just, you know, when you're watching something, say, you guys, you guys are doing a great job of taping this. Isn't there anybody in your crew that can say, excuse me, uh, we're done taping. Can you please stop? <laughs> can somebody call 911? Has anybody got a bandage for this guy? I mean, enough already. We see that in our world and we can poke at that and say, wow, that's terrible. But my friends, we have needs right in our own backyard. We have needs that aren't so dramatic. They're not so obvious. And they're perhaps in our own families. And, and what are we doing? Because they're our neighbors. If Jesus can say that a priest is a neighbor and a Levite is a neighbor and a Samaritan is a neighbor, Jesus has gone way beyond the border of a next door neighbor. He's gone way beyond the border of someone who lives across the street or someone who lives upstairs or somebody who lives downstairs. He's dealing with people groups and who serve the community because the priest serves the community. The Levite serves the community and the Samaritans live outside the community. And Jesus says, they are all your neighbors. So that's why I, I, I began my sermon with a question. Who is our neighbor? Because Jesus sees our neighbor as beyond the person who lives next door. It's someone who lives in our community. Mr. Rogers got that. Anybody remember Mr. Rogers? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Pastor, stop singing that. I will. It's it. Would you be mine? It's not Valentine's yet. But he introduced people from all over the community and people of different walks of life and people who have different issues and uh, some even, even people in a, children in wheelchairs and say, recognize the person in a wheelchair. And they're, they're a human being. Give them some dignity. Show them some dignity. You know, it goes all the way back to my childhood with Captain Kangaroo. Anybody remember Captain Kangaroo? Would you even admit it? Captain Kangaroo brought people in. They were people on the farm. There were people on the outside who... Who, who served and, and con was connected to the, that, that whole community thing that he set up. The same thing with Mr. Um, uh, well, now I'm not going to remember the guy's name, but he was on Channel 8. I want to say Magoo, but it's not Magoo, but he looked like Magoo. Um, but he's the same thing. Now, that back in that day in the 60s, the networks were running these children's programs in the morning. Sesame Street did this as well. Teaching people, teaching children who their neighbors were who their community was. Jesus tells a parable, and he does that. He goes right outside the box of the next door neighbor of the geographic location and says, your neighbor is far out, far more out than you think. Your neighbor is, your connections are far more uh, um, broad than you are letting it be. Who is your neighbor? We should be careful about how we respond to those in need. We, we can't fix every problem, but we can care. We can't pay for everybody's need, but we can be concerned. There are things we can do. do what you can do, you do. Oh, my. Oh, my. I, get, I don't get an amen. I get, oh. Oh my. Do we, do we disagree with the assessment of someone's need? So do we question it? Do we sometimes feel helpless? Do we feel justified when we're walking by? Do we disagree with the assessment of what their need might be? You say you need another $20. I say you just need another fix. So I disagree with your need. I disagree with the assessment. We look at people's needs and we say, I don't like what this is. I don't like where this is going. Don't tell me what the need is. You know, and that's where I get on my soapbox with COVID-19. We look at it and say, my rights. Don't tell me I got to wear a mask. Don't tell me to put this thing on. I know my rights. This mask has nothing to do with your rights. You think it does. 
It has nothing to do with your rights. It has everything to do with safety. You may and may not agree with it. You may not agree with the outcome of it. I will tell you, in some countries where they, where they thought the mask was silly, they, they're having another influx of COVID, and it's much worse than anything we've ever had. You know, after watching all those news reports this summer of France, it's like, look at France. They live so freely and openly. They're sitting in the bars, and they're, and they're doing their nightlife, and nobody cares. Well, France is in, moving into a total shutdown right now. They're almost at a place of chaos in France. Because this, this COVID came back through and took them by storm. Of course, some of you are going to go home and someone's going to go on TV and tell you it's all fake. I, I, I beg you differ. You can say it all you want. It doesn't make it true. You can, you know, can sit here and you know, I'm going to really get, get, some, get you upset. You know, I, I, I have family members who have said, and I've said this many times, I have family members who, they, they, they're, such, they're such racist, it's unbelievable how racist they are. I just, it drives me nuts they're so racist. And I have one who married into a family who out of South Africa who absolutely, beyond a doubt, beyond any doubt, they believe absolutely that all blacks come from monkeys and all whites come from Adam. So all, all whites are from creation, are from God. All blacks in the world are from monkeys. Therefore, evolution. Therefore, they have no souls. So why are we trying to save them? You, do you have any idea how stupid that... I'm sorry, that, I said that, didn't I? Do you have any idea how ridiculous that is? I don't know. They say stupid is as stupid does. But do you have any idea how ridiculous that is? That, that is beyond ridiculous. But if, if they keep saying it, they believe it. And saying it over and over for 200, 300, 400 years doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it true. So you and I can say things that, you know, we like what somebody says on TV. And they say, oh, if they say it enough times, we're just going to say amen. And it's right. It has to be right because that guy on TV said it. It can't be, it can't be wrong if they said it. I've heard a lot of things on TV that turned out to be wrong. That's right, see? Check the facts. I've got a book that I'm reading and I'm wishing now that I had it out here. And it's a, a book written by, and I'll get ready for this. It's written by a woman. She's a liberal. And she's black. And she's writing about the race issues and things that are going on and how things are, how things are going on in, in our world and our society and some of, the, some of her perspectives. You know, I, I don't just read people I agree with because I already know what I believe. I want to read things that challenge me because I know what I believe. And if they say something really weird and bizarre, it's not going to change what I believe. So if I read something that somebody says that the Bible is not the word of God, they're not going to ruin me. They're not going to, they're not going to mess my life up. I'm not going to have to go to a therapist after I put that book down because I know who I believe in. Do you know who you believe in? Now, the reason I, I mention this is because I'm reading some books on race to have under, get an understanding of a broader, under, a broader perspective of what's going on in our world. And I'm reading books that people have written this year dealing with what's going on in our world, in our nation this year. And she, she made this comment. She said that recently her government, she says her government as in the left, put out this statement that says, Scientists say, and blah, 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 blah. Nothing to do with COVID. Just scientists say, and went on this whole thing about wh why, why this has to be true, because scientists say. And she said, her point was, read the facts. And when you read, when you write, when you read a book and you, you see a statement, scientists have said, look for an asterisk. Look for an asterisk. And on this particular quote, she said, 
in her book, you need to read the asterisk. And she puts a quote of the asterisk in her book, and you go down and you read the quote from the asterisk. It has been a study that we are still conducting. There have been a few indications that this, that we had this result, but not in every case, it's still under review. We're really not sure. We don't know the outcome of this because there haven't been enough studies to really decide and give a conclusion. But yet this statement went out on national TV this year, earlier this year, and that was her point. It went out on national TV, on all over MSNBC and CNN and all the other major networks, Scientists have said, therefore, you are to believe everything else that follows. And, and she said, even we recognize, and some facts have an asterisk. And I like that quote. In fact, I told Jeanette, I said, someday I'm going to preach a sermon that says Jesus has no asterisk. Because what he says is done. His word is yea and Amen. There's no, well, this is true, except for, except for, except for, except for. You should be careful. That was extra. That was free. We need to be careful of what's going on in our world. We need to be careful how we respond. We have a lot of neighbors that are hurting. We have a lot of neighbors who are sick. We have a lot of neighbors who are out of work. We have a lot of neighbors who are angry. We have a lot of neighbors that we don't agree with. We have a lot of neighbors that don't agree with us. So let me ask you, are we going to be careless with how we treat our neighbors? Are we going to jeopardize their spiritual journey because we take our issues and throw them out there and say, I'm not helping you. You're one of them. If you stop to help somebody, do you question them? Are you a Republican? Because I am. I'm not helping you if you're not a Republican. Oh, I'm a Democrat. Are you a Democrat? Because I'm not helping you if you're not a Democrat. Do, 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 aren't you glad the, um, the, the ambulance people, the medical personnel, aren't you glad that when they, when, if they come to your house, they've come to my house a few times through the years, and I've had two seizures. And let me tell you, when they come to my house, they do not ask me. And, and both times, I don't know how, both times they knew I was a minister of this church. Somebody speaks. But they never asked me, so what are your political affiliations? What do you believe about? Because we're not sure whether we want to help you render care for you. They just render care. You know, we should be careful about how we approach people, how we, how we think whether they deserve help or not. When your brother or sister is weak, if they're concerned about their health, what do you do? You know, I, I've heard people that have said, you know, I'm concerned, I, I, I'm worried. And, and what I hear is, you don't have no, you don't have no faith. Now, there's a sentence that needs to be corrected in English. Take that to, to an English class. You don't have enough faith. You don't have any faith. Well, if somebody is really concerned about, about their health and they really want to, you to honor social distancing and they want you to honor the mask, your answer isn't, you have no faith. Your answer is, oh, I'm, I see that you're concerned. I don't, want you, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna get you more concerned. I am gonna honor you. I'm gonna honor your concern. So because of your concern, I'm going to da 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 da, -da. Where's my mask? We're not super Christians. We don't tell weak Christians to get over it. That, that's not Christian. That's hypocrisy. You don't tell a weak Christian. And I'm, when I say weak Christian, I'm not saying that a person who needs a mask is weak. But if you perceive them to be weak, and I'm taking your argument from there, because I don't think they're weak. I think they're concerned. I wear a mask. So am I weak? 
I don't think I'm weak. Let's just take it from there, because some of you, you feel like if a person wears a mask, they're, they're weak. So if they wear a mask and, they, and you think they're weak, what is your answer? Do they have to get over it? You know, I have a verse for you that we're going to read at the end for that, just to encourage you and challenge you and I on what our responses are truly, because who is our neighbor? Who is our neighbor? The sick are our neighbors. The weak are our neighbors. The concerned are our neighbors. Those who, who, are, who are concerned about diseases and catching things, they are our neighbors. They aren't, well, I'm better than you because I have more faith than you. You should never use that argument because you're not better. I don't think Pastor Hagee's faith is weak. I, I will never believe anyone's testimony that Pastor Hagee is weak, but yet he can, but yet he was tested positive for COVID-19. I don't believe for one second the man is weak. I don't believe he's lost his faith or weakened faith. I believe, like I told you at the beginning, he ministered with his people. He was willing to step out and minister to people. And in ministering to people, he took, he took the shot. He took the chance. And that was a risk he was willing to, to bear. And that the consequence of that risk is that he contracted COVID-19. So we pray for him. That's the only response. Don't, don't take a shot at him. Pray for him. When our brother and sister is struggling, when they're concerned about their health, we need to seek to comfort them. Second, we need to adjust to their care. You know, before there was COVID-19, I had to wear masks into people's houses. Wearing a mask is not new to me. Uh, I can I know from sitting here that uh, I can tell you Cindy would testify that wearing a mask is not new. And at work, Cindy, you have to wear a mask. Um, it's you do it because you have to be careful and be careful of people with health health issues. In the hospitals, you have to wear a mask until you until you figure out what's going on. When when Betty was when Betty had to go to the emergency room this past week and she was in the hospital. They, before they, they tested her, before they got the results of whether or not she was COVID-19, they, they came in as though that she was, they were from another planet. They had so much stuff on them with all the layers on them because they didn't know, so they didn't take any risks. Do we want our nurses and doctors taking risks? Not if your health is in the middle of it. <laughs> it's not that they take pleasure in it, but they, but they, they are concerned for their fellow human being is as such that they will do what they need to do to make sure that people are safe. And if I'm the person in that hospital bed, I want the nurses and I want the doctors doing what they have to do to make sure that I'm safe. And if you're in that hospital bed and I come to visit you, I wanna make sure everybody's doing what they gotta do to keep you safe. When I visit somebody in a hospital, it is not that unusual for me to have to put on a mask. When I visited Dwight, um, Linda, I, I know this is you know, that time of year. When I visited Dwight, I had to put on the mask and I had to put on the gloves and I had to put on the, what was that? Like a gown thing, just to go into the room. It's not, you know, COVID is not new with the mask and the coverings. It's the latest of diseases that cause us to have to take sometimes what we think are extreme measures. As a pastor, they're not extreme to me. They are just another chapter. Because my role is to comfort. I will wear the mask. I will put the thing over my head. I will put that gown on when I go to the hospital. Because my, my job there isn't to treat you. My job is to bring comfort. So I come and I pray. I may read a psalm. I'll minister to you if you're the one on the bed. And I'll try to minister to your family and pray with your family while I'm there. I will make adjustments to make sure that I can care for someone. I seek, I seek not to accuse them. I seek instead to show mercy. 
church, it's getting easy for us to show judgment and judge people what we don't agree with. But that is not what we were called to do. We were not called to show judgment. We were called to show mercy. And here's the third neighbor. The third neighbor you know already. He's the Samaritan. He stops to render aid. He is known as a Samaritan. He's an enemy of Israel for Israel's part. The Jews curse the Samaritans. And so how interesting Jesus purposely chooses a Samaritan in his parable. And in this parable, this Samaritan stops for he is moved with what? Compassion. He's not moved with judgment. He's moved with compassion. He gave up. In order for this man to show compassion to someone on the side of the road, half dead, naked, bleeding, been robbed, he gives up his time. He's on his way to either Jericho or, 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 or Jerusalem. Doesn't say up or down. So, but he's on that road. And he stops and he takes time. Second, he works for this man's benefit. He stops and assesses the man, talks to the man. He brings out oil and wine. They are both medicinal uses in this case. The wine has an alcohol content and it will, it will clean out the infection of the man's wounds. The oil has, is, has a medicinal property to it. Once you disinfect the wounds, you pour the, 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 the olive oil, you pour the oil over the wounds and it seals the wounds so they can start to heal. So this guy rendered aid on the side of the road. Immediate aid. He gave up time. He gave up and he worked. He gave up his energy. He gave up his finances. First of all, using all the resources he had on him. And then he goes to an inn and he puts him up in an inn and stays with him at the inn. And then he, he turns around when he's done and he has to continue on, on his journey. He gives the innkeeper a couple of silver coins and says, you tell me when I come back how much I owe you. Yeah, yeah, right. In, in this day and age, you look at that and say, yeah, right. Because in our day and age, who does that? Would, would, you go to, would you put somebody up in a hotel and say, hey, I'm coming back in a couple of months. Whatever, whatever charges he, he brings up, I'll pay for it. Don't, don't, don't. Just tell me what the cost is. You know, they're going to say, ah, oh, ching, ching, cha ching, cha ching. We're going to get this guy for a whole lot. Anything? You know, you know, we can be, we can be cynical in our world because we know what happens in our world. But this is not a parable about our world. This is a parable about Jesus' world. In the day of this man asking the question, this man thinks he's smart. He's a smart aleck. And he's going to try to get Jesus. And Jesus gets him in the, in, the, in the argument or the debate of arguments. Jesus gets him. Mike, it's a debate and Jesus wins. He tended to him, bandaged, dressed, wounds, provided lodging for the guy and pledged further finances for the future of his care. So the expert wants to know who his neighbor is. In response to love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to live for eternity. Deuteronomy 6, 3 was the first quote that Jesus uses. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your soul. And with all your strength. And with all your mind. And then Deuteronomy 6, 11, Love your neighbor as yourself. The expert wants to know. The first part of his question, quoting Deuteronomy 6.3, leaves little, leaves little need for interpretation. It's pretty straightforward. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love the God with everything that's in you. But the expert wants clarification on neighbor. So Jesus chose a neighbor who would have been despised by the expert and all of Israel. Jesus chose on purpose. He could have chosen a Roman who's also despised by everyone in Israel. But Jesus knows if, if you don't deal with the, the pain and the sin that's in your heart and in your own backyard, getting rid of Rome isn't going to change anything for you. Because as soon as Rome is gone, 
the sin that's raging in your heart will keep raging against the Samaritans. I'm, I'm going to dig, dig down to the center of who your neighbor is. The Samaritans are your neighbor. The people in your own backyard, you can't love them. If Jesus could ask this question of us, what would it be? What neighbor would he choose for you and me? If we thought we had Jesus on the ropes, we could ask him that question. Okay, Jesus, so who's my neighbor? Would it be somebody you dislike? Would it be somebody you oppose? Would it be a political thing? Would it be someone you're ashamed of? Someone in the family who you like to better keep in the shadows because you're ashamed of them? What would it be? Who would we choose? We love being free from sin, don't we? We love the liberty of being free. But we are not free from helping our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Someone who needs our help. Who is our neighbor? Somebody who needs our help. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to end with this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. That sounds really good. That's chapter 5 verse 1. Don't be all bound up, right? Be, you're free. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. I wonder why we would choose this verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out. Or you will be destroyed by each other. So Paul's argument is, if you can't love your neighbor and you go after your neighbor, what do you think your neighbor is going to do? Your neighbor is going after you. And you're not going to be building the kingdom of God. You're going to be tearing down the kingdom of God. You're not going to open opportunities to reach the lost. You are closing the doors on reaching the lost. That's Paul's argument. Because he goes from there and you and skip a few verses and it comes down to what the whole thing is about in his letter. And here it is. The last few verses. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are all good attributes in looking after your neighbor. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not conform, let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Sometimes as Christians, we find ourselves entangled with the last three. When we should be coming deeply entrenched in the top eight. I think there's eight. Somebody will count them and tell me later. We should be seeking the fruit of the Spirit, not the, the conflicts of the flesh. That's Paul's argument. Live in the fruit of the Spirit and avoid the conflicts of the flesh. The conflicts of the flesh do not have a happy ending. But the fruit of the Spirit will ensure that even in difficult issues in your family and in your life and in your community 
the Holy Spirit will teach you how to be a good neighbor. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I had to get that in there. But we're supposed to be the good neighbor for our own community. And it's not State Farm, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Don't let, don't let conflict and biting and tearing and strife become known for us in our, in our journey in Christ. Let the fruit of the Spirit become part of how people know us. The last thing I want on my tombstone, and I'm not talking about pizza. The last thing I want on my tombstone um, is thank God and Greyhound, he's gone. I, I don't want when I die that somebody looks at my tombstone and says, oh, thank God we don't got to deal with him again. That's the end of hour long sermons. I, I, I want to be remembered for what I've done for Jesus. I want you to be remembered for what you have done for Jesus. We've got a world that needs Jesus. Let's, let's share Jesus with our world. Amen. Amen.